When you sit down to meditate, you've got all four of the frames of reference for establishing mindfulness right here. You've got the body, the breath, feelings, which would be a mixture right now of pleasure and pain. You're trying to work, though, for pleasure. There's the mind, and then there are mental qualities. And even though your focus is the breath, the feelings are right there, the mind is right there, mental qualities are right there. And sometimes you'll notice that it's easy to get them together, and other times it's hard. And so you have to see which is the problem. Is it the breath? Work with the breath. Play with the breath. Adjust it. See if that helps. See if you can breathe in a way that gives rise to a pleasant feeling, a feeling of spaciousness, ease, well-being. But if the mind doesn't want to settle down, you've got to look into the mind. This is why we say that the different frames of reference run parallel as you practice, and you have to focus on whichever one is the problem. If the mind is the problem, Buddha gives two steps to begin with. One is being sensitive to the mind, and the other is gladdening the mind. To be sensitive, you have to step back from the mind's mood and look at it objectively. Which direction is it leaning into? Is it leaning into its likes, leaning into its dislikes, leaning into confusion, leaning into fear? To see these things clearly, you have to have a part of the mind that's not leaning. You want to emphasize that. Remember the Buddha said he got his mind on the path by being able to step back from his thoughts and divide them into two types. Those that were based on sensuality, ill will, harmfulness on one side, and those based on renunciation, non-ill will, i.e. goodwill, and harmlessness or compassion on the other side. Once he was able to step back from his thoughts and see them, not so much in terms of their content, but in terms of the state of mind behind them and where they would lead. The skillful thoughts leading to good good actions, the unskillful thoughts leading to unskillful actions. Then he knew what to do. Abandon the unskillful thoughts, develop the skillful ones in their place. So as you step back from your mind, you notice it's not quite in balance. Remind yourself that if there's anything unskillful in there, you want to figure out how to let it go. This is where you move on to the next step, which is to gladden the mind. The Buddha talks many times when he's describing the steps of the practice that you gladden the mind through the practice of virtue, you gladden the mind through abandoning the hindrances. And then when the mind is glad, then it finds it easy to settle down. So what can you do right now to gladden the mind? In some cases he talks about a fever in the mind that gets in the way of settling down. And the way to overcome that fever is to think of an inspiring theme. Think about the Buddha, the kind of person he was. He had everything that anyone could imagine back in those days as, a, as an ideal, pleasant life. You know, he saw there was lacking, as he was willing to give it all up go out in the forest, go out in the wilderness, and really put his life on the line to find something that wouldn't change, a happiness that wouldn't let him down. He found it. He came back and he taught it for free for 45 years. Wherever there was someone who needed to be taught or was ready to be taught, he would go there. That's the kind of person who found this skill. Then there's the Dharma itself. We're lucky that he have, we have the Dharma of that person still alive, still available. And then there's the Sangha. The people have kept that tradition alive through all these many, many centuries. 
many of them had lots of problems. You read about the monks and the nuns in the Taragata and the Tarigata. And they talk of the obstacles they had in their path, the problems they had in their minds. Some of them were getting suicidal, but they were able to overcome those problems. The whole purpose of that contemplation is to remind yourself that they can do it. They were human beings. You're a human being. You can do it too. So if you find any of those themes inspiring, think about them for a while to gladden the mind. You can think about your own virtue, your own generosity. The times when you could have gotten away with breaking your precept, but your sense of honor, your sense of your worth as a person prevented you from stooping that low. Yeah, that's something to take pride in. And the same with generosity. You had things that you could have consumed yourself, but you decided purely out of freedom of choice to give them away. Thinking about those can lift your spirits. Another way of looking at how you can gladden the mind is to think of those six kinds of delight that the Buddha talks about as being conducive to the practice. The first is delight in the Dharma. It's similar to re recollection of the Dharma. You think about what a great Dharma this is. Oh, it's admirable in the beginning, admirable in the middle, admirable in the end. In other words, it starts with good actions, leads with good actions, and ends up with something that's totally beyond the world. And here you have the opportunity to practice that Dharma. And there's delight in abandoning and delight in developing. In other words, when you see that you have a defilement in the mind, instead of just falling in with it, you take it as a challenge. How can I find some way around this? See it as an adventure. You're exploring new territory in the mind, instead of just simply falling back with your old, your old habits, your old enslavement. You're going to try to work your way out. It's like people in prison trying to figure out how they can get out of prison. And really enjoying the process of figuring this out. And John Mahabua talks about the sense of satisfaction that comes when you see even just a tiny piece of the bark of the defilements surrounding your mind falling off the tree. Learning how to take joy in that. Similarly, with developing good qualities in the mind, you try to take joy in being up for the challenge, even on the days when you don't seem to be getting very far. Just the fact that you're on this quest. And it's a noble quest. Learn how to take satisfaction in that. And there's delight in seclusion. Usually in cases like this, the Buddha is talking about not only physical seclusion, but also learning how to take delight in the fact that when the mind is free of its defilements, you enjoy that, appreciate that. If you don't appreciate it, it's very easy for the mind to fall back into its old ways. As you think in these ways, you find it easier and easier to get the mind to settle down. Because what you're doing is you're getting it on the side of the path. Instead of siding with your defilements, siding with your discouragement, you learn how to side with the side of the mind that really does want to find freedom. And it's happy to be able to have this opportunity right now. Then the Buddha talks about delighting in the unafflicted and dividing in, <coughs> excuse me, delighting in non-objectification. Now those are two epithets for the, the goal, unbinding. But they give you an idea of the direction you're heading. Because there is one passage where the Buddha talks about the different levels of concentration as being less and less and less afflicted as you go up the, up the ladder. 
So as you can get the mind to settle down, just be with the breath, happy to be talking to itself about the breath, adjusting the breath, and realizing that you're not concerned with any sensual thoughts, you're not concerned with anything outside, you're just happy to be right here, right now. You're free from the affliction of your unskillful thoughts. I appreciate that. If you've worked with the breath and it finally begins to settle down and get into a good rhythm, so you don't have to think about adjusting it so much anymore, you can put the work of directed thought and evaluation aside, and you've learned to see them as an affliction. And appreciate the mind, which can simply be one with the breath, one with the body, and so on up the ladder. Similarly with non-objectification. Objectification is when you start out with the idea that you are a person, you are the thinker, and the thinker has his or her world. It's basically getting into a state of becoming. And any kind of thinking that promotes more states of becoming counts as objectification. But you can learn to work in the direction of non-objectification by simply seeing things as events, without building a me around them or a world around them, just simply these events are happening, and this event causes that event, this action causes that action, which causes that action. See them in those impersonal terms, so you can get out of the narratives of me, 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 and my problems. And remembering that the Buddha said, even though the causes of suffering are in the mind, he doesn't have you say, well, what's wrong with me that I'm causing suffering? It's simply, what events in the mind, what actions in the mind are causing the suffering? Can they be abandoned? And they can. What are the events that lead to the cessation of suffering? Can they be developed? They can. You think in those terms, and you can release yourself from a lot of issues. What's happening, especially with these last two forms of delight, is that you're moving from gladdening the mind into concentrating the mind, and then from concentrating the mind into releasing the mind, which completes the four steps that the Buddha lists in his discussion of mind as it functions in breath meditation, as it develops in breath meditation. So the gladdening does a lot of the work. You remind yourself of that when meditation seems a chore, that the Buddha wants you to gladden the mind as you're doing it. And even if things are not going well, do your best to try to figure out what is going wrong, and take delight in the fact that you're doing that and not just succumbing. Remember the Buddha's way of teaching that was described as instructing, urging, rousing, and encouraging. Four verbs, only one of them instructing, the other three encouragement, urging, rousing. To give you the strength you need to gladden the mind, to be happy that you're doing this. And seeing it as the most interesting thing you could be doing. Because what else could be more interesting than figuring out your own mind, especially the way when the mind lies to itself? When it wants happiness, it finds ways of destroying its happiness. Why is that? That should be the most interesting thing possible. And the Buddha says there is a solution to that issue. And when you solve that issue, you found the greatest happiness possible. So lots of interesting things are happening here, and you should be glad you have the opportunity to ferret them out. When you can develop that attitude, 
then you've gone quite a way in the practice. And you develop the qualities of mind that are needed to make this gladdening the mind something that eventually you will not have to do anymore. The mind will find a state where it doesn't have to be gladdened. It'll have everything it needs. And a very strong sense of enough. <laughs>